If you have your Bibles, we do this morning, we ask you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse, Mark chapter 9, in the first verse. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there are some of them which stand here, which shall not taste death, till they have seen the kingdom of God with his come with his power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto him Elias and Moses, and they were talking, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he was not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly, when they looked around about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy that you've provided for our church. Lord, we pray this morning that you would manifest yourself. That's what we stand in need of. Lord, that we might see you as God, that we might see you as the man, not only as the man, Jesus Christ, but as the God, Jesus Christ, as well. Lord, we pray for your presence this morning, Lord, that this would not be a routine time, but rather, Lord, that you would be in the midst of us, that you would walk about, that you would bless us, Lord, that we might praise thee, that we might give you honor, and that we might give you glory, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it is in Christ's name that we pray, amen. And I will be preaching this morning on how do you praise the Lord? How do you praise Him? How do you lift Him up? How do you magnify Him? Now, let me say this in starting. I understand that there is a little difference in each of us how that we might give Him praise and that we might give Him glory. But I will say this. Every one of us that are redeemed deserve to praise Him. In other words, we are required. Uh, he deserves our praise. He deserves whatever we possibly can do. And those of us that are lost, those of you individuals not yet born again, you know what? You owe Him praise as well because He's given you breath of life. He's given you health up to now. We ought to always praise the Lord but with that, we have somewhat of an inability. In the first verse, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things there. First of all, this, uh, this statement about the kingdom. What Israel wanted from the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ was to be an indigenous kingdom again, separate and apart from Rome, and be their own people again. And that's what they looked unto Jesus for. And when it did not happen, they were through with Jesus. When it did not occur, but the kingdom is the Lord's people, saved, redeemed, born again people, they did see the kingdom. They saw people saved. They saw individuals born again, and that is the beginning of the kingdom. Now we know that the Lord Jesus Christ will literally rule from the throne of David, and the kingdom years are a thousand years coming, but the kingdom began right there. What do you have to have to have a kingdom? You have to have citizens, and you have to have a leader, and we have both. And so we see that he was being very forthright with them, but like most of the time, they didn't get it. And you can't criticize the apostles because most of the time, we don't get it either. 
Uh, we think we've arrived and we think we understand. You know what? I think about myself in my own mind. If somebody had told me 22 years ago that I would believe and stand for what I do today, I would tell them that they were crazy. Yeah, but you know why? The Lord brought me along and He brings us along all along the way. And there are ways to praise the Lord and similarly, there's ways not to praise Him. We must lift Him up. And I want you to see in verse 2, and after six days, that is portion of a week, they came back around again, and after six days, Jesus taketh with Him Peter, James, and John. Now that was the inner circle, the three that was tightest with the Lord Jesus Christ, the three that was nearest to Him. Now, if you want to see Jesus magnified, you've got to be close to Jesus. And just because you're saved does not mean that you're close to Jesus. Just because you've been born again does not mean that nearness exists. In fact, if you've, if you've truly been saved more than just a short time, I would say this, you've had close times and you've had far times, you've had near times under the Lord, and you've been other times you even doubted the salvation that you possess. Nobody abides in that place forever. And so I want you to see that one thing, if we're to praise Him as we should, is nearness unto Christ. Do you have that this morning? And after six days, Jesus taketh with Him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them. Now, if you want to praise the Lord, you have to be led by the Lord. A lot of this stuff, screaming and hooting and hollering and falling down and foaming at the mouth. Do you think they're led by the Lord? I don't because the Bible says that everything be done decently and in order. Now with that, I don't think that we should march in here like Hitler and, and take our place and do like this and be fearful to say anything because the Bible is against that as well. Let every man everywhere lift holy hands and praise the Lord. Now, most sovereign grace Baptist churches, if I went in that, they'd be ready to sell me, sell me out as a bill of goods. But I will say this, someone that knows how to praise the Lord and is willing to be led of the Lord, they, they will note that. All the men that preached at this Bible conference, there was a, a microphone at the pulpit. When I went up there, they pinned one to my shirt because they know that I wasn't going to abide there long. And that's okay. That's a good thing. And, and that's how it should be. We're not going to be a people that just totally out of control. But at the same time, We've about give up true praise. Yeah. Yeah. We've about give it up. And so we see in that that um, there, we have to be led by Him if we're to praise Him. And if we're not led by Him, and I do want you to see that it's Jesus, then there's not much, there's not much praise there. And let them up on a high mountain. Now, I don't know much about mountain climbing. I used to love to climb stuff when I was a kid. I don't think I could do it anymore. There's a lot of rock bluffs, limestone bluffs over there at home where I grew up. And the only thing I can say about climbing is it's not easy. If you want to climb something steep, and what does most people like to climb? From the view on top. That's why they like to climb. I mean, it's not no necessarily a wonderful thing to be sweating and pulling and, and dragging yourself and, and, and with the risk of fall at any moment. It's not necessarily pleasant. But when you get to the top, you have something that most people do not have. You have something, a view that is particularly for those that have tried. So we find that the first of all, they had to be led of the Lord. And the second thing is it takes effort. You can cannot worship the Lord and just not put anything of yourself in it. Now I want you to see that they were apart. They weren't with everybody else. It was just them. And he was transfigured before them. Now, it became known, it became known as the Mount of Transfiguration, but I want you to see before that it was just a mountain. Uh, 
when we see the Lord transfigured, that would be an unusual thing for us. And I'm not necessarily, I don't believe that we'll see Him transfigured in the eye of the flesh. I don't believe that no man has seen the Lord Jesus Christ since the apostolic days when He died. I believe Paul was probably the last one. But I'm saying this, if you've not seen Jesus as King, and if you've not seen Jesus as Lord, and if you've not seen Him as the complete sacrifice, you've not seen Him. And so they went to a separate part. It took a little effort to get there. And then when they arrived, they saw the Lord transfigured before them. Now, this transfiguration was literal. In other words, His visage was changed. Matthew's Gospel uh, tells us that His visage was ch changed and He did shine as the light of the sun. They saw Him as God. They saw Him as He looked in glory. They saw Him as He was before, before He put on the mortal flesh and came down to be a sacrifice unto us. They saw Him for who He was. And that should always end in worship. But does it? When you see the Lord of Christ manifested in New Testament Baptist Church, does it end in worship? Do you lift Him up? Do you praise Him? Do you give Him glory and honor for who He is? Most of the time, we do not. Verse 3, His raiment became shining exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto him Elias, or Elisha, is the Old Testament term, same person, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, can you imagine, I'll give you two things. Number one, uh, Abraham's bosom still existed. Paradise is where these two men were at. They weren't in heaven as we know it now. They weren't in, in the third heaven of the abode of God. And I'll give you two reasons why. Number one, the blood had not yet been offered and they could not spend time with God Jehovah without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an impossibility. And uh, the other thing, the Lord Jesus Christ said to, uh, to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, not that you will be with me in glory. They were two separate places. And, and that ended with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I do, I do say this, that they also, which is a marvel to me, they knew who, he, who they were. Did you ever think about how did they know? How did they know that that was Elisha and that was Moses? How, how did they understand that? We know that they did. And, and I want you to see that huh, what an unbelievable time it was. I would have been interested to see what they were talking about. Verse 5, And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elisha, for he wished not what to say. Now let me say this, if you don't know what to say, keep your mouth shut. If you're uncertain what to, to respond with, just keep this big thing from flapping and keep, you know what, that's the only reason he said it was, you know, I, I don't know, have nothing else to say, and so what about three tabernacles? Well, first of all, they didn't need their three tabernacles, they needed one. You know what? Elisha didn't deserve a tabernacle. In fact, uh, James says he was a man like unto uh, the same flesh as we were. And he prayed that it would rain not, and it rained not for the space of three and a half years. Just like us. Same stuff. You know what Moses was? Same stuff. Moses killed a man. Same stuff. But, I will say this, because they yielded themselves unto the Lord, they were used greatly. We will never be used greatly until we entirely yield ourselves to the Lord. Money, possessions, self, years that we have here on this earth, never until then. And so, we see that Peter's idea of praise wasn't correct. Peter's 
idea of lifting him up wasn't correct. In fact, you know what the Lord said? There will be a time, as we said to the woman at the well, there will be a time when they will not worship on this mount or any other. And that was coming, and he predicted that. So the first thing that we see, that somehow Peter had missed the boat. He did not get it. Notice why he said it. You know, why he had this idea about, because he was afraid. What the Bible says, you know why we don't worship him the way we should? Because we're afraid. Because we're afraid. That this is common among God's people. You know why we don't lift him up? Because we're afraid. You know why we don't get out on the streets and preach the gospel and sing all of how I love Jesus? Because we're afraid. We are fearful of the results. We're fearful of being made fun of. We're fearful uh, uh, that, that uh, they may cast us out of town. So we see two things. Number one, that Peter had the wrong idea and that he moved before he should have. And lastly, that he was afraid. Verse 7, And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. Now, I want to notice two things. First of all, that, that huh, God, Jehovah, the Father, said, Listen, huh, there's no need for tabernacles. Uh, you listen to my Son. And I want you to also see in that, that two of the Godhead appeared right then. God, the uh, Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was standing there. They hear, heard the voice of God the Father, the great God Jehovah, both at the same time, but yet and still they are one God. That's a hard thing to get a hold of, is it not? Yeah. But it does exist. A few of you, not many, a few of you have seen me as Larry the nurse. Uh, Brother Grigsby arrested over at Paducah, and Donna and I resuscitated him. I was no longer a pastor. I was no longer a preacher for that brief of time. I worked the code in about the same spaces over there, and I was Larry the nurse. If I say to one of my children, Sarah Page, they know they're in trouble because I use middle names when I'm upset. And that's Larry the Father. And when I'm up here, I'm Larry the Preacher or Larry the Pastor. That's three different persons, is it not? I'm called to do three different things in and, and different roles as myself. And so we find God the Father and displaying Himself as Father. And we see God the Son displaying Himself as Son. And the Lord uh, God of Heaven saying, All you need is to hear that one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, at the, and as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man these things that had se they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And so they were to keep it to themselves. So we find that even after, at this point, they were really nearing the end of the Lord Jesus' ministry, that they still didn't understand praise they did not understand worship. They did not understand lifting him up as he, as he should be lifted. Now, I want you to look with me back in 2 Chronicles. And all through the Old Testament, we find good examples of, of scriptural praise to the Lord, how we are to lift him up. And, and you, uh, uh, you say, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, what makes it null and void is what I would like to know. Uh, people want to jump on that bandwagon, uh, and it's placed here for our learning, is what the Bible says. Second Corinthians, I mean, I'm sorry, Second Chronicles, chapter seven, in the very first verse. Second Chronicles, chapter seven, in the very first verse. Now, when Solomon had a had made the end of praying. Now, one of the chief elements of praise is prayer. 
One of the chief elements of lifting him up is coming prepared to the house of the Lord. Now, you don't have to answer me. You don't have to tell me what's going on in your life. But how many people prayed for this service specifically? Not just praying for me as your pastor, but that you prayed for this service this morning on, uh, on April the 24th that God might meet with His people. How many of you prayed to that end? That, that's what we are to do. We find Solomon as the, as the Lord God is fixing to come down and abide in the temple, leaving the tabernacle and moving into the temple, that Solomon prayed a very long prayer. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. Now that is very, very significant because man did not initiate it. How was the sacrifice done most of the time? Man was lighting the fire, right? Here we find God lighted the fire and came down and consumed everything in its place. You know why? Because they were prepared. They were ready. They had prayed. You know why churches are so dead today is, uh, is minimal prayer life. Just old anemic prayers that don't get the job done. That it, when you get up, you know you had not met with God, but you've gone through a routine. You write it off as prayer. And that's what we need to avoid. Notice what it says. It consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. How many times have you seen that in your lifetime? I've seen it a few times. I've seen it when the glory of the Lord filled the house and it was an overwhelming. What does glory mean? Anybody in here know what glory really means? It means light. It means magnificent. It means unbelievable brightness that will just take you out of the way. That is glory. I've seen it a few times. Sad to say, I've not seen it many, but I've seen it a few times. And you know what? What New Testament church needs and, and the churches at Clarksville, what we all need as God's people is to see that more. I will guarantee you we need to see it more. The Shekinah glory of God coming down and meeting with His people, we stand in great, great need of that today. Verse 2, And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Not even enough room to squeeze in and not enough room to even get in there because the glory filled the house. You know what? When the glory comes down and fills the house of the Lord, it won't matter what I say anymore. It won't matter what you think about me. It won't matter what you think at all because the glory of the Lord fills the house and we enjoy Him. Yeah. Have you ever experienced it? A few times. I hope you have. I hope, I hope you understand what I'm talking about this morning, that you, you've been there enough to know what I'm speaking of, and that's what happened here. Verse 3, And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement. You know what that means? It means they bowed their face down against the pavement. Not, not anything to interpret, not anything to say, well, what does this mean? What is it saying to my heart? Oh, no. You know what the Bible says to that stuff? The Scriptures are without private interpretation. You know what that means? What it says to me, it says to you. That private interpretation will get you into trouble. It won't let it take you long to err from the faith. Be careful about that. So the thing that I can come to when glory came down, they went down too. How many times have you seen that? I mean, really. Few and far between. Why? If I laid out here, what would you think of me? That Larry had finally, the, the court could find the pot. 
But he, 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 he's left us. He, he, you know, the stress has been too much for him. What would you think? And then I align it with Scripture. What would you think? What does everybody say about that verse? That's the Old Testament. Right? But the only thing is, you find example after example after example in the New Testament. That's the problem. And so we see then that if we're going to serve the Lord, number one, we're going to have to be humble enough, either literally or figuratively, to bow before Him and give Him the praise that He is so much due. Verse 4, Then the, then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of twenty and two thousand oxen, a hundred and twenty thousand sheep, so that the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Now I want you to see uh, one more thing in this, that if you want to worship, it's going to cost you something, both figuratively and literally. What, what, uh, what is, and I know all of you that's gone here for a while, uh, maybe uh, Sister Barbara have to think about this. Why is the tithe box back there? Because the last time you see it in the Word of God, that's what it was. So I don't know where else to put it. This running around a plate, you know, you know who came up with that? The Methodist. I don't know why they're trying to embarrass people that can't afford to give something. You know what? Putting it up there, and I've seen churches do that. Yeah. They err from the scriptures. Yeah. You know that's so. Well, look at me! I'm giving fifty dollars. You know what that is? It's pride. Nothing more than pride. It should be done in a very secret, private way between you and the mighty God of all heaven. That, that's how it should occur. And so if that hasn't changed, why should this have changed? If, uh, in the things that we do unto the Lord, we should praise Him, we should give Him glory, we should give Him honor, and the only reason that I can come to is that we don't see Him for who He is. Look with me in the book of Isaiah. Uh, some of my favorite scriptures, um, I don't know how many times... I've read them in your hearing, but here's one more. Isaiah chapter number 6 in the first verse. Isaiah chapter number 6 in the very first verse. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. What a wonderful blessing when we see that God, the Lord, is high and lifted up. Now why do you not want to see that? Why does the flesh have an issue with that? I can tell you why. And the why is this. That puts you under His dominion. That puts you much less than what He is. And I want you to also see that Isaiah was a saved man, and there's five chapters that precede this. And the only conclusion that I can come to is he didn't see it before. Right? I don't know, you know, you may can interpret and come up something good for me, but the only thing I can come to that the rest of it had been mediocre. The rest of it had been another day at the park. The rest of it, in fact, you can read those five chapters and he's very critical of God's people. You know what? When criticism takes you over, you better be very cautious of where you're at spiritually because certainly there are people out there that don't serve the Lord as they should, but what we should do is pray for them and talk to God about them and quit criticizing them and quit putting them down. What we should do is give Him glory uh, and pray, uh, give God the glory and pray for Him. And so we saw that uh, Uzziah, I mean, I'm sorry, Isaiah got a very unusual view of the Lord high and lifted up, and his train, his body, his presence filled the temple, and, and above it stood the seraphims. 
Each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. Now, if you look at an angel today, if you see it on the television, or if you see it on a little idol out like you get at the Christian bookstore, how many wings does an angel have? Two is exactly right. How many does the Bible say? Six. And you know why? Because in man's eyes, a six-winged being would look stupid. Right? But they have six wings. And you know, so what I have to come to the conclusion is this. When the Lord is high and lifted up, there are angels around. Right? What, what does the Bible say concerning us? For their angels do watch over them. That makes me the only come conclusion I can come to is I have an angel. He's kept me out of a lot of trouble. He, he's kept me safe when I ought to have died. He, he's been with me. That's the only conclusion that I can come to. And that means you have an angel, and you have an angel, and you have an angel, and he gets the job done. And so when we are on sync with God, the angels are present here with us, and, and they know how to praise the Lord. Listen, you know why they praise the Lord so well? They are created beings. They are created, and the only thing they do is praise the great God Jehovah. And because they don't have flesh, the flesh don't get in the way. You know why? I have to come to this conclusion. Then why praise is rare for us, the flesh gets in the way. Because you know, angels don't have flesh. They're, they're spirit beings. And, and so we see then that, that that is the problem today is our flesh gets in the way and we're embarrassed and we, we, we don't want to be seen as the Lord. Verse, I mean, we don't want to seem as a foolish person. Verse 3, And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy. Now, a lot of people get that messed up because they will do what I just did. Holy, holy, holy. But what did it say? That one cried into the other. In other words, I say, Holy! And Brother Terry says back, Holy! And I say to Brother Ashley, Holy! And he says back to me, Holy. Read, read the Scripture. That's exactly what it says. That's giving Him praise. That's giving Him honor. And one said to the other, Holy, Holy, Holy! These individuals, these created beings, know how to praise God. The whole earth is full of His glory. The post of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then uh, said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts. That was His result. You know what? When we get around and near unto God, we're going to see how pitiful we really are. We're going to see ourselves as unclean. We're going to see ourselves as undone. In fact, it said that the that one of the flying uh, angels took a took a, a coal from the altar, altar and rammed it in his mouth. And when that was done, what, what was the result in his life? Here am I, send me, send me. You know why people don't want to be sad no more? They don't praise the Lord. It's the only thing I can come to. They're not, uh, they're not in the center of His will. They, they may be saved. I'll tell you what, one of the most miserable places you'll ever be is in the permissive will of God. Because you are His, you belong to Him. And you know in your heart you're to preach the gospel across the seas, but you say, hey buddy, I'm not going. That's not for me. I don't even like to get out of the state of Tennessee, much less get over to the other side of the world. I'm not going. Well, you go that route, you stay with that stuff, and you'll be the most miserable individual you'll ever find. If you don't believe me, ask Jonah. Right? 
And so we find then that this, uh, that this chorus of praise, no doubt, is what praise is about. It's what the Lord enjoys. It's what is needful even today. Go with me to the book of Revelation. We, then, we there too get to a glimpse of of what's going on around the throne in the spirit world, we get a glimpse of, of what praise is to look like. Now notice what it says in the very first verse of Revelation chapter 4. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, in the very first verse, John is given the church letters, very scathing messages to all but one. And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as, it were, was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. Now, as by some Baptists like to paint the picture of this, you know what that says? I was in the Spirit. In fact, the Bible, even in the very beginning of this text, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, every time you arrive at New Testament Baptist Church, are you in the Spirit? Now, I will say this. Follow your Bible always. Look right now at that Spirit. And is it capitalized or is it lowercase? See, W.T. Thomas did teach me a little bit. That second one is lowercase, meaning His Spirit. Now, when you come to the house of the Lord, are you in a good spirit or are you on a bad spirit? Every one of us, if we be honest, I've been, I've been to churches and as soon as somebody walked in the back door, I, I, they were on a head hunt when they got there. They was ready to cause trouble. They was ready to cause problems. They were looking for somebody to focus their anger on. And you know what? They weren't in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. You know why God don't meet with His people? You get a bunch of rebels together, you think God's going to put His approval on that mess? Certainly not. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And so we see that an element of praise that must be there is the Holy Ghost, and we got to be in the Spirit as well. We have to be uh, in a frame of mind ready to praise the Lord. And I heard was... Uh, um, Verse 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. Now the next thing that you need to know about worship is God is high and lifted up. He's on the throne. You know why? Me and Donna had a little trouble starting out to Michigan. Because God is high and on the throne. You know why we made it safely there and safely back? God is high and on His throne. You know why uh, uh, things uh, improve in life? Because God is high and on the throne. You know why things deteriorate in life? Because God is high and on His throne and He doeth whatever seemeth good to Himself. He is God and God alone. Now, when you see Him like that, you'll be ready to praise Him. You'll be ready to give Him glory and honor and praise simply for who He is. But when you see Him as an old man and the situation's out of control and Hurricane Katrina's coming and nobody knows what to do, when you see Him like that, you ain't seen God. How are you going to worship a God that's out of control? You know what? If He's out of control, wondering what will be next, Really, he's not worthy of our praise, is he? He ain't no better than we are. But when you see him as the sovereign God of the Bible and everything under his feet, you will praise him. You, if you're in the right mind, you will praise him. You lift him up because he's God. He's the great God Jehovah. All things under his feet. You know what the miraculous thing about Jesus walking on the sea? is because He was above it. It had no influence on Him whatsoever. That's God. Verse 4, And round about the throne 
were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, they're not angels. Second of all, we don't know who they are. Some people say, well, I believe that was the twelve tribe heads and the, the twelve uh, apostles. Well, the only problem with that, and it could be, it never says that. I will say, first of all, it never says that, so we can't take that to be. The twelve tribe heads, except for two, were outright rebels. Reuben and Gad, you think that they deserve to sit on a throne like that? Benjamin and Joseph were decent, good men. And I don't even know if that qualifies you to sit in the throne. What about the disciples of the apostles? Some people say, well, the, the problem with that is this. Not all of them were good men. We know the Bible says one of them was a devil, right? And have you ever seen the epistle of Bartholomew? <laughs> it doesn't exist. You know why? He went in for the long haul. The Gospel of Thaddeus, have you ever heard of that? No, because it doesn't exist. It is not con considered, to, well, it doesn't exist, the best I know it. If it was, the King James translators didn't see it's the Word of God. And so because of that, we find hmm, that probably these were just men that made the difference. I don't know who they were, but certainly going out on that limb is, is where you'll get cut off, probably. And, and, and so we see, whoever they were, their mind was to praise the Lord. They did have a crown, whether it was the crown of life or the, uh, or the what, what of those five crowns you find in the two, New Testament. They did have a crown, and they did have it re ready for praise. Drop down to verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. And again, I think we've seen that as indicative of angels about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Sound familiar? Very same words almost that you find in Isaiah. Very same number of wings. I think it was the same creatures that were praising God, giving Him praise. And these events, 4,000 years apart. And they're still saying, Woo! Glory, glory, glory. What a blessing that would be. What a blessing that would be to see. Verse 9. And when those beasts give Him honor and thanks to Him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne, and worship Him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. What a wonderful blessing that is. That they weren't embarrassed. They, 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 weren't, they weren't chambered by this flesh. They weren't limited to embarrassment. But they just threw them off and you see they fell before Him again. Do you see a pattern developing? Do you see some consistency? Embarrassment's out of the way. What does that happen? Most people say, well, they're out of their heads. Oh, the Scripture don't even teach that. Well, I beg to differ. Because you know where the one was? In the Old Testament. You know where this one is? In the New Testament. Right? Very same experiences, very similar events. One in the old, one in the new. Praise hasn't changed. Giving glory to God has not changed. It's still the same. Look with me in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. Wherefore, 
tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them that believe. Now, the, the tongues that it's speaking of is an unknown tongue to some people, and they are for saying, hey, God has adorned these people. This is God's people. That These belong to Him. But I want you to see the unknown tongue is not for God's people. If I came in here speaking Spanish, if I invited Brother Kraft to come and preach for me today, and he, and he took off in Mexican Spanish, would we benefit at all? I probably would, I would probably hear about seventh, every seventh or eighth word with my poor Spanish skills. Some under here wouldn't even get that. It wouldn't be edifying. What's the word edifying mean? To build up, right? It wouldn't be edifying to most because we wouldn't get what they're saying. We wouldn't understand. And, and, and so we see in, in this event that uh, that's who those were for. But if they all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the, are the secrets of his heart made manifest or obvious. So falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is of a truth. So what does he do? He falls down before God. And the Bible there calls it worship. So where are we in giving Him praise? Where are we in giving Him glory? And am I, am I saying that has to be a constant? Am I saying is that always done? No, but it isn't wrong when it is done. We should give Him praise. Praise, however that is. We should lift up His name. We should glorify Him when the truth's being preached. We need to say, Amen. When the, when the Lord comes down, we need to recognize it. We need to give Him glory. And we need to encourage one another. Thank you for that lesson. What a blessing that's been to me. You know what? Your life and just your consistency has thrilled my heart. How often do we do that? Almost never, right? 